I ask that you please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel for today comes from Matthew chapter 25. Glory be to you, O Lord. This will also serve as our sermon text for today, by the way. Jesus is speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was lacking clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or lacking clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer them, Amen, I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Lacking clothes, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not take care of me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or lacking clothes or sick or in prison and did not serve you? At that time, he'll answer them, Amen. I tell you, just as you did do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours and mine, alone in Christ Jesus, who is our only Savior and Lord. Amen. Text for this morning was recorded in Matthew chapter 25. Pastor read it just a moment ago. I'm not going to read the whole uh, section again. It's a portion of God's word that you're very familiar with. The last day, the end of the world. Um, But I would like to introduce it by reading verses 31 to 33 once again. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear ones in Christ Jesus, at the time of the Apostle Peter, Shortly after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, the Apostle Peter talks to us about one of the most important events in the history of the world, the end of time, the end of this world. And in our text for this morning, the Lord Jesus himself tells us that he will be coming back to this earth a second time as well. And we know that day very well to be called what day? Judgment day. On that day, every single man, woman, and child who has ever lived will stand before the judgment throne of God. And what that means then is that every single one of us sitting here today will also stand before the judge. And so the question that I'd like you to ask yourselves today and every single day of your life until the Lord calls you home or Jesus returns back, comes back to this earth on judgment day, whichever day happens first, Ask yourself this question every day and answer the question well. What will you say to Jesus 
on Judgment Day? It's kind of an intriguing question, isn't it? Very important question to answer correctly. Now, in our text, Jesus describes the judgment scene in as clear a picture as you find in all of Scripture. We see the believers as sheep who are placed on Jesus' right-hand side. Now, on the other hand, we find the, believer, the unbelievers who are described as goats were placed on Jesus' left-hand side. The terror of the judgment is emphasized in these particular words of Jesus to the unbelievers when he says, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. What's Jesus doing here? Oh, he's scolding them, right? But even more importantly, he's condemning them. And why? Because of their lack of good works. Now, just a couple of months back, I'm certain you guys celebrated the Lutheran Reformation once again. This year, obviously, was Reformation 500 plus one, right? And on that day... I'm certain you talked about the fact that you're saved not by your works or lack thereof. You are saved by the good works and the life and the suffering and death and resurrection and the assurance of the, found in those things of Jesus Christ and through faith in him alone, right? So how in the world can Jesus say that he's going to condemn these folks because of their lack of good works? Well, the Bible also tells us without faith, And I'm going to ask you to put these words into brackets because they're not found in the actual text, but they are found in the context. It's specifically talking about him. Without faith in Christ Jesus as your only Savior from sin, as your only way to heaven, it is impossible to please God. And so the unbeliever's lack of good works in the eyes of God are evidence of their lack of faith in Jesus Christ as their only Savior from sin. Now, to the sheep on his right comes this wonderful invitation from the Savior Jesus. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And you see, their good works, which are listed elsewhere in this very same chapter of Matthew 25, are evidence then of their living faith in Christ Jesus as their only Savior from sin as their only way to heaven. So, what all this means, dear friends, is that when it comes to where you'll spend your eternity, that there's either a right or there's a left. That's all. There's either a heaven or there's a hell. There is no fence to ride. There is no in-between. It's either one side or the other. In fact, one of the things that we don't want to do is is we don't want to uh, play any kind of a plastic Jesus game. You know, we don't want to be lukewarm, as uh, as the Apostle John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes in the book of Revelation. You know, there was a congregation there to whom he specifically was writing, and the folks were lukewarm. And he said, what did Jesus say to that congregation? He says, I wish that you were either, you know... uh, hot or cold, but as it is, you lukewarm, and therefore I will spit you out of my mouth. See? Riding the fence is saying, you know, I'm not so sure I want other people to know the fact that I'm a believer in Jesus as my Savior. I don't know if I really want them to know that or not, because that might create problems or difficulties. I don't want them to know that. That's riding the fence. That's playing the lukewarm Jesus game. Jesus wants us to be hot for him. Hot for our Savior. Hot for his word of promise. That's what Jesus wants us to be. Not lukewarm, not cold, but hot for him. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what God's word does for us above anything and everything else. God's word does this and creates this in us, makes us hot for our Savior and hot for his word. All right? Now, 
That brings us to us. What will each and every one of us here say to Jesus on Judgment Day? What I'd like you to do for the remainder of this sermon is I'd like you to imagine that you are standing in line waiting to be interviewed by Jesus for admission into heaven. Now, there are plenty of people ahead of you, so you'll have a chance to think about what you're going to say. But I'd encourage you as you're standing in line and, and, and that you would listen in and hear what some of the folks are saying, maybe figuring out some of the things you might not want to say to Jesus on Judgment Day. All right? First person in line steps forward and says, you know, Jesus, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't one of your followers, but I never really had a chance to believe in you. I mean, my parents never took me to church. They, they never told you, me about you, so I never really had a chance to believe in you. And Jesus will say, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You had Moses and the prophets. You had the entire Bible. You have the natural knowledge of God, the law of God written in your hearts and in your minds. You could have taken my word and searched my word and found out about me. But you didn't think I was worth it. And so now and for all eternity, you are worth nothing to me. Depart from me. Next person steps up and says, Lord, I... uh, I know that I wasn't always perfect, and I know I didn't believe in you, but hey, I, 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 I did an awful lot for you. I mean, I, I gave more than my fair share to the United Way, and I tried to help people who were less fortunate than me. I mean, that's more than a lot of people I know. And Jesus will say, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What you were doing all the times you're trying to impress someone. You thought that by doing this, you would think that people would think that you're a great person and pat you on the back. Well, you've had your pat on the back and a great name. Now take them to hell with you. Next person steps up and says, Lord, hey, Sunday, Sunday was that one day out of the week that I could do some work around the house. I mean, you you know how hard I worked all week long, Lord, and, and you know that stuff that you gave to me, that stuff that you said I should be a good steward of? Well, Sunday was the one day out of the week that I could do some work around the house, and so I'm sorry if I offended you, Lord. But I just didn't have the time. And Jesus Jesus will say, you know, (laughs) depart from me, you are Christ. If you had truly loved me, then you would have found the time. Just like you did for camping and hunting and fishing and golfing and shopping and da 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 whatever else you gotta add into that phrase. You say that you had no time for me. Never again will I have for you. Whew. Line's getting really short. Thinking about what you're going to say. And steps up and says, Lord, I, I know that I didn't often make it to church, but hey, Lord, I, I was a member. I mean, you can check it out. My name's written in the church books. And Jesus will say, your name may be written in the books at church, but your name is not written in my book of life. Therefore, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Next in line says, Lord, I'm sorry, too, that I, that I wasn't often in church. But, you know, hey, I always sent in my contribution. I always paid my church dues. And you know what Jesus says? He'll say, I didn't want your money. Didn't want your money. I don't need your money to get the work done that I have to get that I want to get done. What I wanted was your heart. I wanted you. And now your money will perish with you. Next in line steps forward. Speaks, Lord, hey, I think you're going to be happier with me. I really do. I mean, I, I was a faithful member of the church my whole life. I mean, I was baptized there. I was confirmed and married in the church. I was even, I'll even be buried in the church. And Jesus will say, you hypocrite, depart from me, you who are cursed. All that time that you worship me, you worship me with your mouth. 
But your heart, your heart was far from me. You may have fooled the people in church, but you didn't fool me. Now depart from me. Line's getting really short. Next person moves up, speaks, Lord, I have truly been a faithful, faithful Christian. I mean, I, I have read my Bible almost every single day. I brought my children to our Sunday school and our catechism classes. And hey, I honestly tried to do what you wanted me to do all the time. And the Lord says once more, what you were trying to do all the time is you were trying to impress someone. Because if you had really understood your Bible when you read it, then you would recognize that you cannot sit on the gospel while others are dying without it. It was your opportunity, it was your responsibility to share me and what I have done for all people with others. You should have done the one without neglecting the other. But since you don't love me enough to share me with others, I will not share heaven with you. Depart from me. Next in line steps forward. Lord, hey, I know that you're going to accept me. And, and, and how can I know this? Because I've already suffered a great deal during the course of my life. I mean, I was sick almost day after day. The same thing could be said is true of most of my family members. I mean, I've had the bill collector at my door time and time and time again. I mean, I've had more problems and shake a stick at. And so I know, I know that you're not going to make me suffer anymore. And Jesus says, you know, depart from me, you workers. Why, why didn't you come to me when you were weary and burdened? I would have given you rest. I would have helped. But you wouldn't come to me. And now it's too late to come to me to ask for help. You waited too long. It's too late. Next person steps up, speaks, Lord, I have truly tried to be the kind of person that you wanted me to be. Lord, I have, I have really, really tried hard to be that kind of person. I, I know that I've sinned many times. I, I'm, a, I'm ashamed about many of the things that I've done. I'm even ashamed to admit them. But Lord, I, I tried. Doesn't that count for something? And Jesus says, in my book, trying hard counts for nothing. Because in my book, you must be perfect. Even as my Father in heaven is perfect. You are not perfect as God expects you to be. Therefore, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And now there's only one person ahead of you left. You're next. To give your answer for the hope that you have. The last person in line before you steps up and speaks. Lord, I have fallen many, many times. But I know, I know. Because the Bible says so. That you died on the cross to pay for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus will say, depart from me, you who are cursed. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It isn't simply enough to know about the things that I have done. The devils know all these things. And what do they do with that knowledge? They tremble at it. You don't know me with your heart. And therefore I confess, I don't know you. Depart from me. And now you're next. You're next to stand before the judgment throne of God. All the thoughts, all the excuses, all the rationale, all the good works that people have brought before the Lord Jesus to try to make themselves right before him or or to appease God in some way, all of these things have done it. They've crumbled into the dust. He's looked into the hearts of every single person who has stood before him. All the good that you thought that you had done has just passed away. And now you stand spiritually naked before the judgment throne of God. What will you say? Well, my prayer 
is that each and every one of us on that day, whenever that day comes, on that day would fall down to our knees and with absolute confidence and certainty say something like this. Lord Jesus, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Your blood and your righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Lord, I could not make myself right before God. You know, even if I can be perfect from this point in time forward, I, I cannot go back and undo the, the wrongs that I have done throughout the course of my life, all the times that I have broken your commands over and over again. I cannot go back and undo those things. I need you, Jesus. I need your perfect life and your innocent suffering and death. And that announcement on the cross that you gave, it is finished, which assures me that my sins have all been paid for once and for all. And then you allowed your body to die. And three days later, you raised yourself from the dead to assure me of the fact that my sins are forgiven. And not only did you love me enough to do that, but then you sent your Holy Spirit to work through the gospel and word and sacrament to create faith in this stone-cold heart, which has now been made into a heart of flesh that loves you who first loved, were first loved by you. And you keep me in that faith. You've kept me in that faith until this very day. And it's because of you, Jesus, and only because of you that I am confident that I will be with you and all those whose trust is placed in you, like me, forever. And then Jesus will say to those, Oh, my dear brother or sister, how can I refuse you? You are right. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. pastor mentioned at the very outset of our worship service today that today is a Christian education Sunday. We talked about specifically, you know, the benefits and the laurels of Christian education at the high school level, you know, in the the fellowship hall a little while ago. But you know, today is a Christian education Sunday, and yet I'm normally, when it comes to a Christian education Sunday, the flavor of the sermon or the message generally has a Christian education flavor to it, right? And I'm not quite so sure that uh, this sermon has had a, your standard classic Christian education flavor to it or not. I don't think it has. And yet when you take a look at who's been at the heart and the center of everything that's been talked about today, namely Jesus, we recognize the fact that Jesus is at the heart and the center of everything That is called Christian education. If you're receiving some kind of education, you know, uh, supposedly Christian education that does not have Christ Jesus and what he has done for us to save us from our sins at the heart and the center of it, then that supposed Christian training is nothing more than man-made gobbledygook that will get you nowhere but to hell if you hold on to it. And you focus on it instead of the one in whom our salvation is found. You know, we hear so oftentimes people say, I have a strong faith. See, I can handle it. See, I got a strong faith. Whenever I hear that kind of terminology, I get real nervous. Because our faith is only as strong as it is in the one in whom it is placed. And if my faith is placed in my strong faith, my ability to handle it, I'm on shaky ground, man. But if my faith is placed in the rock-solid promise of salvation in Christ Jesus and the rock-solid promises that we find of God to us, that he gives to us as his children found in his word, then my faith is on solid ground. Then it's rock-solid. And that's what Christian education is all about. That's what Christian education does. You know... Christian education is is vital and important and a blessing at every stage in life. You know, it's 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 not just important for those who are pre you know pre confirmation age. It's important for every stage in life. You know, oftentimes you know we get the mindset that you know we get through confirmation classes and we and we're confirmed and then we stop any kind of formalized Christian education or training. Why? Have the enemies that we had prior to confirmation, 
Have they gone away? Are they not with us and, and battling against our natures and our souls every step of the way, every single day? Any less now than they, for us that, who are beyond confirmation years, than they did before we were confirmed? If you think so, show me in the scriptures that that's the case. Christian education is vital at every stage, every step of the way. From the real, real little guys, which are a few here, who can't get from point A to point B without being carried there, to the early element, you know, early childhood stage guys and the elementary school age guys and the, and the high school age folks and even the college age folks and those of us who are a year or two from your classic college age folks age. Our sinful nature is still with us. The world in which we live, a.k.a. our peers, are still with us, striving to take that saving faith in Christ Jesus away, striving to take our peace and our joy and our happiness away from finding it in Jesus and his word and putting it in any face or place or, 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 or space other than Jesus. And Satan is there cheering them on, wanting it all to happen, Right? We have the same enemies. We are the church militant this side of heaven. We know that the war has been won by Jesus. And for that we are eternally thankful every single day. But there are many battles that take place every single day. That's where Christian education is so vital. It keeps our, our hearts and our minds focused on Jesus and the rock-solid promises of his word. You know, we talked about the last person before you stepping forward before the Lord Jesus. Remember the second last person? He said... I know, I know, because the Bible says so. You know, you may know all the Bible facts. You may know all the Bible truths. You may know them. You may know all the, all the stuff in the world, like Solomon being knowledgeable and wise about all the world stuff. You may know all that stuff, but knowing all that isn't going to save you. Because there's a big difference between knowing it and trusting it. Knowing it and relying on it. Knowing it and putting your full spiritual weight on it. Part of the challenge that we have when some of our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus stray away from the fold. And you go and you talk to them. And you say, you know, what's going to happen to you when you die? Well, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, how can you be sure of that? Well, because Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. I know these things. But knowing those things and trusting in those things are two different things. And that's where the Word of God, Christian education, every step of the way, dare I say every day, is so vital and is such a blessing because it keeps our hearts and our minds focused on Jesus and all these rock-solid truths of God's Word. How are we going to turn to these rock-solid promises if the Holy Spirit has not had a chance to keep us hearing those things and recognizing the blessings of those things on a daily, on a regular basis. When we find ourselves in challenges and difficulties, and any of us who have lived for a year or two recognize challenges and difficulties in this life, when those difficulties and challenges of life come, where are we going to turn if we don't turn to the rock-solid promises of God's Word? Never will I leave you or forsake you. I'll make all things work out for good. Where will we turn? We'll turn to our own Devices, our own smarts, our own whatever, which is really shaky ground, isn't it? Really shaky ground. We want to focus on Jesus and when our Lord God who loves us and wants to give us joy and to be happy in this life as he prepares us for the next through Christ Jesus. We could spend a lot more time in this. Your pastor will have much more to say about these things in the weeks and months and years to come, I'm sure. But suffice it to say, Christian education, there's nothing like it. It doesn't get any better than that. All right? Let's close this morning with the initial question that I asked you at the very beginning of the sermon, the question that we've been looking at throughout the course of the sermon today. I'd like you to think about this question every single day of your lives. And I want you to answer it well. What will you say to Jesus on Judgment Day? Amen? Amen.